This is our second week in the book of Philippians, and uh, I haven't spoken with Chaim since before he left, And we, but before that he had talked about, you know, hey, we're, let's, let's go through the book of Philippians, so that's what we're going to do. Um, last week was the first week that we did that, and I'm going to recap a few things that, that we talked about last week. I also want to tell you right now that uh, the title of this message I, I titled was a, a Believer's View of Life and Death. And after kind of looking at the notes and looking at the amount of material uh, last night, I realized, you know what, uh, I think you need to kind of break break up what I was talking about today into two different uh, two different messages. And so kind of the life and death stuff, I think we'll, we're going to get into next week. So that's sort of a, a teaser. A little, is that right? That's the way we're right, Mr. Strong. I know your media guys are teasers. That's my, that's my teaser uh, for uh, for next week. So um, I had planned to get into all that today. So I don't know what I would entitle this one today other than uh, maybe maybe uh, lighten up or something like that. And you'll see what, that, what I'm talking about there. But uh, we'll, we'll get there in a little bit. But that's kind of my plan. And we'll see if God has any other plans beyond that. Um, but just a couple of things to kind of get us in the in the frame of reference again from from last week. Uh, this book written by Paul, uh, nobody really disputes that, um, and it was written roughly twenty or thirty years after the events of Yeshua, um, but even closer in time period, probably about ten years closer than that to the time period that Paul established this congregation in Philippi. But just to keep that in mind as you're reading this, this is. Um, on the one hand, it might seem like you know it was ancient history for us, but these are these events, these this this these things, this development of this community is um, taking place at a at a time of, after events that really weren't that far in, in the past. They really weren't that far in terms of them being impactful for you. I mentioned last week a couple of events you remember that happened that we know about 20, 30 years ago, you know. Remember I said OJ was sent free uh, to 20, 30 years ago. Now he's free again. Look at that. That just happened. Uh, Oklahoma City bombing, a Columbine shooting, the Berlin Wall, these kind of things that are, are history, but they're not like they're they're so far gone in history that they're not in, in, impacting us or change the way we think in some ways. So just to kind of if that helps you in context as you're reading and how people might have received this uh, this message from Paul. This letter that we see later in the, in the book, in chapter 4, where Paul talks about this group of people being the ones, really the only ones that had partnered with him, uh, partnered with him in giving and receiving. So clearly they had supported him financially and prayerfully and physically. They were, they were very much involved with, with what he was doing in a very practical way. And so we can look at this letter, and many people do look at this letter as uh, kind of like a, a missionary report, if you will. If some of you support ministries or missionaries, you get letters and updates from them and so forth. And that's what this one was more about versus some of his other letters that were more correctives and you guys are doing this and that and there's false teachers and, and so forth. This is more of, of more of like a, a ministry report letter um, kind of thing. And they had heard about Paul's imprisonment. And so now as Paul, again, is writing to let them know his condition. Kind of here's, here's you know, I know you heard, heard about me being in jail. Let me tell you what's going on. And more specifically, what we see that he ends up talking about is the condition of the ministry instead of just how he personally is doing. He wants them to know that things are not a loss because of his imprisonment. In fact, he's going to tell them it's, uh, it's really quite the opposite. So really, there's, you know, any worrying you're doing in that respect is, is unwarranted. And so a, a few applications uh, from last week. Just to kind of get us going here, if you remember at the outset of this letter, Paul refers to uh, the folks he's writing to as holy ones or kedoshim. And remember that that's not the idea that, you know, if someone were to call you a holy one of God or a person of God, this is not saying that you are perfect in any stretch. It's not what Paul is saying, that this is not a perfect community that he's writing to. But this is the idea that being holy or, 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 or kadosh is being set apart for a particular purpose. And so that's what that that's why it's okay to receive that if you feel that God has called you. If God if you're here, most likely God has called you and has set you apart for his purpose, not uh, not that you're perfect in any way. He also refers to himself uh, and Timothy as slaves or servants of Messiah. 
And if you remember, we talked about, you know, that sometimes brings with it the idea, a uh, very negative idea, like oppressive, like you're a slave and you're, you're a servant. But how really, that, that's not the biblical uh, idea of a slave, even when we read in, in the book of Exodus. But certainly in this case here, um, this is not the case, that you really do need to consider yourself as a slave or as a servant of Messiah as opposed to, say, a, a contractor, you know, you're, you're a 1099 employee that you, you, you offer your services to God, absolutely, and he's your main contract, but, you know, you, you kind of do it on your own terms, you take your time off, you take care of yourself, and so forth. It's not that. That's not what being a slave or a servant of Messiah is about. And one part, one aspect of being a slave or a servant of Messiah is that, you know, you're not necessarily responsible for the outcomes. We see in verse 6 that Paul talks about a good work that has be, been begun in you. I will see it through to completion. So sometimes that's not the way in which you think it should be completed the way you think it should look when it's completed. And so you kind of have this choice as a servant. You can say, fine, I'll tell you what, you're in charge. It's not up to me. And so we'll do it your way. But that's actually not the attitude that the slave or servant of Messiah should have. Just because the results are up to God and just because you are the servant in this situation does not mean you can or should serve with that kind of an attitude of, hey, we'll do it your way. You know, I'm not responsible anyways. So we need to have a good attitude as we, we serve and as we slave, in a sense, <laughs> to God. Um, and then also, we, we look, saw where Paul talked about a desire, a desire for his audience, which we can, by, by, uh, by connection, say is us as well, that they would exhibit a love that would come from um, not just the, the love when we think about experiencing love, it's when things are good or good feelings and so forth. He says, I would, I would pray that you would have a, a love that would flow from, a, from knowledge and from a depth of discernment of, of the Lord and who the Lord is. That's where your love should flow from, um, from that depth, from, from that knowledge and depth of discernment. And so that you'd be able to discern the things that are pleasing to God, the things that are excellent in God's sight. Um, if you remember, I talked about the idea that there's lots of things in the world that are, that are fair. You know, we talk about the middle class of America and so forth, and I'm not putting any of that down. I'm just trying, was trying to highlight the fact that there are things that are good in life and things that are okay and that are passable. Um, but yet God wants us through a, through a knowledge of him and a depth of discernment of him to be able to recognize those things that are excellent. Because if we're not careful, we end up comparing all things to kind of the values of the world. And if we put those as our values, and those are the things we're, we could very well fall into the, the hands of the enemy, and we don't want that. We want to keep our eyes as, as set-apart ones and servants of God. We want to keep our eyes on um, the things that are the standards of the one in whom, for, uh, uh, for whom we're serving. So, that's some of that introductory material, some things that we talked about last week. And now, when we get to verse 12... Paul moves on to a, a very uh, traditional uh, transition into, you know, getting to what he knows is the concern for his viewers, I mean, for his uh, his readers, viewers, <laughs> for his for his readers, which is, you know, how how are you doing? And so that's how he starts off in in chapter twelve, and uh, I want to read, read kind of read through this again. So chapter, uh, not chapter twelve, verse twelve. Verse twelve says, "Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters." that what has happened to me has actually resulted in the advancement of the good news. And so my imprisonment in the cause of Messiah has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. And because of my imprisonment, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord to dare more than ever to speak the message fearlessly. So, again, he's getting into this, this piece here where he knows that they know, I know, I know that you know, uh, that I've been going through some stuff here in Rome, and what has happened to me, right, being imprisoned. And this brings up what I think is um, something that's often talked about uh, amongst the body of believers, is this idea of, of struggles and adversity, right? If you were to look, look at a lot of sermons, they would like to talk about, you know, kind of take all this information, superimpose it onto your struggles and your adversity. Um, and some will say that as believers, there's, there's, there's this side of the equation that says as believers, you know, in Yeshua, as believers and followers of God, we should have absolutely no struggles, 
and live in complete wholeness. We should live in complete wellness. We should live in complete victory. We should live in com complete shalom as a, as, a, as a child of God. There's that side of the equation. Others will point to passages like this, sections of scriptures like this, and say, no, you know, look, look here. Here's Paul, right? Here's a, here's a believer for sure. And, and this tells us that a believer's life will absolutely come with struggles. In fact, it's the perseverance in the face of those struggles that becomes our testimony and, you know, case in point right here with Paul. And so we've got these sometimes, you know, poles of the, of the equation here. And, and, and I would say uh, yes and no to, to those things, right? Uh, specifically, you know, God can and does work in and through His children during difficult and trying times, okay? And that can serve as a testimony to being strengthened and empowered by Him despite any turmoil, okay? So as a model... We can look at that. Now, however, this is a very different idea, or very different from the idea, that God deliberately punishes or humbles people in order to teach them a lesson. Or worse yet, to make them more holy somehow through, through, through suffering. This is a, these are two different, very different ideas. One is working through struggles. One is the idea that God's placing struggles on people in some, in some fashion. Um, and I said it last week, probably, but I, you know, we should not seek out or embrace difficulty and hardship just for the sake of the difficulty or the hardship. That's like, so I wonder what it's going to feel like if I hit my hand with a hammer. I can tell you what it's going to feel like. I'd say you should avoid that, you know, kind of thing. It's kind of that idea, you know. Um, that 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 idea is, is what's, what's called. Uh, you may have heard it called ascet. Uh, I'm pronouncing it right, asceticism. You know, punishing and you know, punishing your flesh. Paul even talks about this. Other people will take that and say this somehow makes me more holy. But ultimately, if we really focus on this, you know, I, I need to punish myself and want to invite struggles and so forth. You know, it kind of backfires in the sense that it still puts the focus back on you and your flesh and what you're enduring. Okay. Yes, there will be trials in this life. And again, even the underlying example of believers suffering for their faith does give us a model in terms of perseverance and trusting God. But again, not for our glory, but for His. And so this actually is a much bigger topic, and I've only scratched the surface. And where I want to focus is really where the text, fo where the text focuses and what the text is talking about. Because in this bigger discuss discussion of um, personal welfare versus hardship and struggle and so forth. So infrequently do I find that the focus ever really goes to where the focus of Scripture goes quite often when it talks about the idea of struggling and, and, and hardships and so forth. It never really comes up. And namely, that the struggle specifically that's being spoken of here is not just generalized hardship, you know, lost my job, this, that, and the other, life's hard, can't get along with my family, whatever it might be. And because of that, that's why I don't think we should necessarily look at Scripture like this and then superimpose it onto our personal struggles. Um, because it is a specific, it's a specific struggle and oppression for being a faithful follower of Yeshua. That is very clear here in this text that that is the one and only cause of of the hardship here. This is this is the struggle. It's not it's not anything else other than that. Okay? It's not because, you know, we shouldn't look at this as well because we have a swelled ego and God wants to keep us humble. But suffering for the open proclamation and living out of your faith is what's being talked about here. And most of us, quite frankly, don't face this type of opposition. They really don't. And I, so I think that this may be, though, however, then why we t people tend to try and superimpose these struggles here, because you know that we read about in Scripture onto the experiences that we have in life in general. But you know, it's really not like Paul's oppression for his faith is is a thing of the past. Okay, uh, it's not like it's something that we cannot relate to or expect today. We should be prepared for it if it ever does happen. In other words, people accusing you or ridiculing you or marginalizing you or judging you just because you're a follower of Yeshua. I don't believe that 
I mean, I'm not being put in prison for that, but I do believe many of us probably could raise their hand and say, no, I believe I have been looked at differently, passed up, or thought of a certain way, and so forth. So that is legitimate. And that's the focus of the struggle that I think we need to consider here, for sure. Um, but again, it's not something we should proactively invite into our lives or go out and seek on our own. But again, it, it, we need to think about it. And quite frankly, um, it would be a great blessing. Again, not that I want to seek it out, but it would be a great blessing for that to be the reason you're getting persecuted. Because the scripture says it also, but because think about it, when it comes to accusations and so forth, if I were to say, um, I'm trying to pick something even, if I were to say that uh, somebody here, let's, I'd say you came to the office this week and you, you, or you stole something from me at the office, you know, and you said, I've never been to the, I didn't know where your office is. It, it, that, that accusation is a lot easier to roll off your back versus if you have been to the office and maybe you're there you know, from time to time or something like that. I'm not accusing anybody of that, by the way. But I'm just saying, when there's a little bit of truth to an accusation, it makes it, it, it's harder to take sometimes when there's absolutely no, no truth to it or, or a reason for, for persecution. And is the belief in Yeshua and following your faith, is that a real reason? It, it's, not, it's not really a reason to be put in jail. It shouldn't be, of course. I mean, we, we can talk about in other places in the world where it actually is the case and so forth. Um, but again... If, if, you, if there's some, there's any, anytime there's an accusation, there's some truth to or some real, you know, merit to anything, even something small, it's a little harder to roll off. Looking back at verse 13 again, though, this is where it's very specific that this is what's being talked about here. This is not generalized struggles. Paul says, my imprisonment in the cause of Messiah, okay? And then he goes on in, in the next several verses going through uh, verse 18, actually, to talk, it's all about the Messiah. This is not talking about just that, oh, they hit me in the leg and this had happened and, they, and I lost my, my position in the Sanhedrin or whatever it, it is. Uh, he goes on in these verses uh, no less than five times to talk about this is all about the Lord. He basically, he talks about the Messiah three times. He talks about, you know, the Lord, the message. And this is all about his faith in Yeshua. And that is the root of the struggle and the root of the persecution that's being spoken about here. And again, our struggles do, uh, or sometimes are due to uh, our sin, for example. Other times they're due to just life. And other times they are due to our faith in God. And those are the ones that this text needs to instruct us about. Again, we can have a model for perseverance, but we don't want to say, yes, we all are going to experience struggles, and we should, because look, Paul did here too. His struggle was very specific. And so the struggles in our life that have to do with our faith in God, again, not necessarily coming from God himself, but a struggle that seems to be as a result of your faith in him, and therefore it's trying to shake your faith. Okay? That, that, that's going to happen, and that can happen. Yeshua himself, you know, says that, that when he's talking to his disciples, he, he says they're going to be hated, they're going to be persecuted for his namesake, and that's what, that's what the same thing Paul is saying here. It's the same thing we're reading about uh, Paul experiencing here. It's very impressive, you know? How impressive really is it to, to realize that Paul's only offense that he is presently suffering for is that of talking about Yeshua? When we talk about accusations and things, how, how, how great of an accusation would that be? The only problem I have, you know, the only problem I have with you, you know, I've never heard that one before. The only problem someone's had is my faith. It's not happened. It's pretty impressive, you know? To the prisoners, to these guards who are like the the elite of the elite, that's like the secret service of the Roman, you know, Roman detail and so forth. Um, here's a guy that you, you've often heard the joke. There's no you know, everyone in prison is innocent, right? Everyone in jail, you know, is innocent and so forth. This is a case where you know these 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 prisoners and these guards are looking at this guy, saying this guy this guy is innocent, you know, at least in the sense that he's not committed a crime like a lot of the rest of of those criminals in there had, you know. I mean, how, how bewildered or impressed would you be if, if you found out on Monday like that the, the person that had been working side by side with you for the last 10 years at your job was a, was a volunteer? Doing the same thing you're doing, you know? Or maybe that the, 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 the person that comes and picks up the trash at, your, at the end of your driveway every, every week does it for volunteer sake, you know? Does they, they really believe in the mission of the company that much, you know? They really, they're doing it for that reason, you know? They really shouldn't be there like those other people are or like that you are at work, you know, but they are. I think it would say a whole lot. Now, it's not a, it's not a perfect analogy when you go home and think about it and then come back. That analogy was kind of 
That wasn't really applicable. It, it, you know, give you a little latitude on that. It's not a perfect analogy, but the idea is that the person is, is somewhere and doing something for a completely unexpected and seemingly abnormal reason. That would seem, seem that way to most people. But the even bigger point that Paul is making here is that his work in Messiah went on not just in spite of the adversity, but it actually advanced because of the adversity. In other words, Paul, Paul is, is telling his folks here in his, in his letter, um, he's not saying, you know, don't feel bad for me. I know this happened, but look at the bright side, you know, which is, we like to look for that sometimes. He's saying, no, this, this actually is working out better than I could have planned it, better than if I, if I wasn't locked up in jail. Things are happening better. And this is, this is what he's saying. He's not trying to look for the, the silver lining so much as the overall idea that we saw in verse 6, like I said, that God will seize, the, seize his plans through to completion, that the work he's begun, sees it through, not necessarily the way that you, know, you might want to. But something also very important to see here is that instead of reporting how he was doing, you really don't see that much here, do you? You don't say Paul saying, oh, you know, if his Jewish mother, she'd want to know, are you eating? Are you, you know, are you warm? And this kind of stuff. But he's not talking about any of that kind of stuff, you know. He reported how, how the gospel was going, how his ministry was going. And this, I think, is a big lesson for, for us to be, to be outward focused, to not be concerned all the time with, you know, our personal situation and our flesh and so forth. That's often the report, you know, many of us get when, how are you doing? Well, a little pain today, but yesterday was better, you know, whatever, this kind of stuff. Paul didn't mention one of those things one time. He was very focused on what he had been set apart for. And so again, whatever our, our chains in life might be, you know, we, we can look for ways in which the gospel or our ministry uh, might be advanced through them. You know, how our belief and our, our trust in God can be highlighted and put on display. And the, the big zoomed out overall theme in this portion here, I believe, is, uh, or these, these few verses, is to subordinate your personal agenda to God's agenda. Subordinate your personal agenda to God's agenda. So I'm sure Paul's personal agenda would have been how to get out of that situation, for sure. But when difficult and even life-threatening circumstances face you, are you able to look for how God might be working in those circumstances to advance his kingdom, either in your life, through personal growth, or in the life of others? It's a question, you know? I think sometimes we, we get really panicked uh, uh, nowadays, and to the point where sometimes I don't even want to watch certain things on the news. We get panicked about, oh man, how, look how things are going. They're just, today's, you know, liberal agenda, or if, if, that's, if, if you're against that, you know, just work with me here. Um, how it might actually be really aiding a more conservative cause than you realize, you know? The fact that things are just so crazy and everything goes, well, if everything goes, maybe, maybe now the gospel will go. Maybe being a believer, an outspoken person, of a conservative voice might be, might be the case also. Um, but likewise, I think the fact of the matter here is that Paul's confinement was doing more for his ministry and for the kingdom than uh, what him being outside of prison could do. <clears throat> so going on for, the, for the, the, the verses 14 to 18, the last verses of the section that I'm going to get into today, it says, because of my imprisonment, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord to dare more than ever to speak the message fearlessly. Some are proclaiming the Messiah out of envy and strife, but others out of goodwill. And the latter do so out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the good news. And I am appointed is this idea that I'm, I'm here. It's like I'm, I'm in this place. Um, the former proclaim Messiah not sincerely, but out of selfishness, expecting to stir up trouble for me in my imprisonment. But what does it matter? Only that in every way, whether in dishonesty or in truth, Messiah is being proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. So he's talking about a couple of sides of, of people who are talking here. Um, and sometimes we think about, oh, these, the ones that are, that are doing it out of envy and strife are not doing the right, or saying the wrong things, and then these are saying the right things. But that's actually not what's being said here. Uh, both sides were speaking the word of God. I mean, Paul uh, elsewhere talks about you know, he speaks against people, hey, you guys are listening to the wrong, the wrong message, the wrong gospel. But that's not what he's saying here. He's really acknowledging that they're both preaching the gospel, okay? Some are doing it from this reason, some are doing it from this reason, but they're, do they're both doing it, you know? And um, so he's not warning them, saying that some people are saying the wrong things. 
Um, there's again, there's there's some strife and rivalry on one side, and others out of love. So some out of envy and rivalry. This is thought of to be possibly, you know, Paul is uh, possibly more envious of Paul's quote unquote success in ministry, you know, and now he's confined in jail, so they're going to try to get ahead while he is while he's there. Uh, possibly could be that um, they are embarrassed and want to distance themselves from this embarrassing thing. They've got their their leader, so to speak, in jail, so they want to distance themselves. That possibly could be what the strife and, and, and the envy side of the equation is all about. Um, it's not too important, however, to pinpoint exactly who the opponents are or who the supporters doing it out of love are or, or and maybe the, the nuances of each of their messages. What is important to glean from this, this thing that Paul says here is the way in which we view our own work, I think, or our own approaches to ministry and specifically how they line up with other others who are of like mind or close like mind, you know, and this is not too too far out of an idea for us. I think it still goes on today. I think no matter what uh, beyond you show, you know, whatever. Maybe you've got a favorite, you know, person you watch on YouTube or a favorite, you know, whatever that you watch, or a, a political commentator. But ideally, we're talking about a, a minister. Um, I have certain people that I watch sometimes. I think no matter how much you think that they're awesome and you love everything they say, just about. I guarantee you there's people, uh, there are people that have videos out about them that, that, that they're the worst thing ever. You know, they're guaranteed there's someone on the opposite side of the equation that's opposed. Uh, I saw, for example, um, I think it was this past week, I saw a, a video of, um, many of you, you may know Ben Shapiro. Uh, he had a talk with a guy named William Lane Craig, who's an extremely well-known, successful, what's called an apologist, gives a defense for the faith, does it from a very philosophical standpoint. He's phenomenal, right? So he and Ben Shapiro had this conversation. It was a very open, good conversation between two very smart people. And Ben Shapiro is an Orthodox Jew who, who doesn't believe, obviously, in, in the claims of the, of the New Testament and so forth. And so they got into that. I mean, they weren't, they weren't shying away from the topic. And Ben would ask them, you know, questions about, so why is that important? Why is the, the Trinity important? Or why is, you know, God becoming a man important? Why, uh, what, what's our reasons to believe that the resurrection actually happened? And William Lane Craig gave very direct answers to, you know, here's, the, here's things he used to support the claims, the truth claims of all that stuff, right? I thought it was great. I'm watching this thing. I mean, there's no, there was no missing any words there. But guess what I found on the internet and in the comments? Oh, how horrible William Lane Craig did and how he, he conceded and didn't say this, that, and the other. And if he'd have just said this, that, and the other, and if he'd have really focused on the Trinity, that would have been the thing that he needed to say. And over here, he was almost you know heretical and so forth, and on and on and on. Uh, and, and there were people that said, look, you got a brother here, you know, uh, William Lane Craig, who was able to, to present a good defense for God's existence and, and, and good evidence for Yeshua's resurrection. Should we not be happy about that? You know, and so the discussion went on and on and on. And my application from this is that I think it's best to preach uh, or do ministry or simply live out your walk with God as something other than a response to what you see other people doing. Okay? We don't exist to Yeshua at Zion because every other Messianic congregation gets it wrong. We don't exist to Yeshua at Zion because the church is pagan and they celebrate Easter and no, never. And if that's what you're here for, thanks for coming. But, you know, I'd recommend, you know, quite frankly, I'm speaking for myself. I think I'm speaking for the leadership that's here at least as well. We didn't start, you started Yeshua. You know, did you start it as a, because everyone was wrong? No, I don't think so. James felt like that. You know, we wanted to start this congregation. He felt a need to start in this area, and that's what happened. It wasn't as a response to, uh, to what we saw other people doing. And so I want to encourage us to be big picture people, okay? Not people who must highlight, you know, your distinctiveness from other believers or hold everyone else's form of ministry up to a certain set of standards with, that you've cobbled together or determined that this is the correct, you know, this is the litmus paper. If you ever did chemistry, you know what litmus is. This will tell us whether your message is true or not because that's not what Paul's talking about here, right? Um, Romans 14 uh, verse 4 says that, you know, who are you to judge and others another's servant before his own master he stands or falls and the fact is is that the spreading of God's word is more important than the one who spreads it quite frankly and this is the bigger message here than the specifics of, of the preachers you know that Paul's told Paul is saying that the message being equal 
you know, regardless of some of the specifics, uh, the Word of God and its message cannot be stopped and it cannot be restrained. So it's, it's, it's good for us not to worry so much about that. Paul expressed this same thought in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8-9. through 9. He said, Remember Yeshua the Messiah, raised from the dead, from the seed of David, according to my good news. For this I suffer hardship as a criminal, even to the point of chains, though the word of God is not chained. His point is that, again, the message is going to go forth regardless. You know, And his message was, Remember Yeshua the Messiah, raised from the dead, the seed of David. Not many argue that point, but, now, but we, was he raised from the dead because he chose? Was he raised from the I mean, the point is we're going to get into all that. That's what people like to get into. But he says, look, the word of God in its, in its core form cannot be chained. And Paul is not completely dismissing motives for preaching as unimportant. Don't hear that either. Motives are important. Um, but at the end of the day, those can only be changed by, by God himself. But we need to view our, our own work in ministry this way too. Whether you're on the front lines speaking, whether you're, you know, being seen, let's say, or whether you're behind the scenes, we need to realize that, yes, our motives are important, but God controls the motives, and we should not act or live in a way that's just simply in response to other people who aren't doing things right. And we can also learn from this that, that we should lighten up. Here's my title that I came up with on the spot here. We should lighten up on others and how we view their particular version of faith and ministry. As with Paul, you may experience some people in your life that for some reason uh, just don't appreciate what you're doing in terms of your walk with the Lord, and it might be vice versa. And I want to say that you need to try and stay mission-focused, big picture, and that your overall desire should be like Paul, who he finished here by saying, you know, he had joy because the word was going forth. So let's pray. Lord, I do thank you for, for this, uh, this message that you've preserved for us here today, Lord, to realize that despite sometimes the way that you are working out your plans, uh, despite them not matching up and lining up with, with the way we might do things or the way we might wish they would work out, Lord, that yet you do work them out nonetheless. We ask, Lord, that as we are and we have been set apart for your purpose, Lord, as your, as your holy ones, that you would continue to show us and to enlighten us, Lord, as to uh, you know, how to live our lives and how to see that you are working out your plans, uh, even when they don't necessarily seem like they're going the way we want them, Lord. Help us to internalize that reality each and every day as we seek to understand uh, how your plans are working out to the completion in our lives. Help us to stay mission-focused, Lord, and how that we could seek your glory and seek that your reputation would be carried on. We'll see that next week as we see that the idea is that we, we, we want to see what's left behind, Lord. And it's not, not us, but it would be for your glory. I do pray, Lord, that if anyone's here today that doesn't have any assurance, Lord, that, that you are working in their lives, or that you do care, Lord, that, that, you would, that they would seek you and that, that, they would, that they would realize that as they turn to you, you would turn to them. Let's pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen.